Good morning and afternoon, and welcome to Business Lessons from the Military. I'm your host, Kevin Bemmel, and we are here every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time for a half hour to talk about how we can apply military doctrine, history, and leaders to making our businesses more successful, whether it's a business that we started and run or whether it's a business for which we work, doesn't really matter. The principles for business success transcend who owns the business. And, and so I think you will find, no matter where you're coming from in that regard, I think you will find these lessons valuable um, because we really get into a lot of the nitty gritty of what it takes to, to get a business built, get it prosperous. So for the last several weeks, we've been talking about how we can apply Marine Corps warfighting doctrine to business. And I always take a moment to mention, I do not consider business to be warfare. Um, rarely is, is business an existential um, undertaking. Perhaps if you're in the healthcare industry or you're a, you're a you know, brain surgeon or something like that, then of course, people's lives may be at stake. However, the way you run your business won't necessarily be something that would be the difference between life and death for an individual patient, or hope, hopefully not. Um, but having said that, much of what we need to do to be successful in combat, we can apply to being successful in business. And that's our, our launching point. So we're going to continue with, with our discussion of Marine Corps doctrine. Bring up my PowerPoint here. I think I've got it. See, I have it all set this time. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. Okay, so here we are, the way to wow, business lessons from the military, and everything we do on, on the way to wow shows revolves around the three pillars of attainment. We're operating primarily here in the pursuits pillar and, and even more specifically in finances. Um, however, as you will see or hear as we go through this, oftentimes these principles apply to other areas as well. And I'm not sure why that's not advancing. There we go. So in prior um, shows, we talked about levels of activity, strategic, operational, tactical. And then after that, we talked about actions, initiative, and response. I invite you to go to our YouTube channel at The Way to Wow Shows on YouTube, and you can view previous shows for business lessons from the military. And I'll talk about the other shows in our series um, at the end of, of today. And we're going to continue now with the theory of war um, adapted to business. So our topic for today is styles of warfare, or what we might call styles of, of business. So um, what I mean, oops, <laughs> went there. So this is, I think, one of the more difficult um, theories to translate from, from combat to the business world. Um, but, but I think once we under, once, once we get a better understanding of these two ideas, you will, you will see quite readily how they apply. So there are essentially two ways that warfare is conducted in a linear fashion and on a maneuver basis. So other terms we might use for these are, for, a, for linear, we might call it attrition. So we've, we've got an objective and we're just banging and banging and banging and banging until basically we break down that objective and we, we conquer it. We, we you know, kill or 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 um, wound all the forces on the other side. We destroy their ability to maintain combat integrity, and 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 now we have won. The other 
And the other side is maneuver where we won't necessarily, but where destroying all of the enemy's combat capability may not be a prerequisite for victory. So if you consider how victory was attained by the allies in World War II in the Pacific theater, initially was thought, you know, how are we going to do this? Because um, U.S. military thinking, as well as the other allies, was still very much focused on a linear, on an attrition-based basis. And in a huge ocean <laughs> like the Pacific, that, that just wasn't work. And, and so um, both General MacArthur, who led the Southwest Pacific Command, and um, Admiral Nimitz, who led the Central Pacific Command, they came upon a strategy whereby it wasn't so important to reconquer every island that the Japanese had taken. Rather, what was more important was to be able to move forces ever closer to the Japanese homeland in a way that, um, that allied combat force could be maintained. And in many cases, they skipped over islands. And in doing so, they didn't destroy the Japanese garrisons there. What they did is they cut off the Japanese ability to supply those garrisons, and eventually either the soldiers had to be withdrawn or, you know, they perished on those islands. So the, the sort of direct banging away at every single island was not necessary. The idea was to get close enough to the Japanese homeland in order that um, the leadership of, of, of Imperial Japan would feel threatened and then, uh, you know, hopefully have them um, uh, um, what's I'm, I've lost the word, um, give up unconditionally, give uh, surrender unconditionally. Okay, so you you might be thinking, well, wait, <laughs> how does this apply to business? Well, I, I think there's a very important application. And, and we're, I think we're in the midst of a very important evolution in how business is conducted right now. So it used to be that business was very much a linear, almost an attrition type function, meaning that a, you know, a producer of a product, for example, so they would, they would, it was, it was like hard sell all the way. If you've ever seen movies like Glen Gary, Glen Ross, um, where they have these um, uh, phone calling pools and very, very hard sell, it meant not all that all that mattered was producing sales. Okay, and that was that was very much the attitude of business for quite a long time. So it was a very linear approach. And it was a linear approach, not just to selling to customers, but also cutting out the competition. So there was no sense of uh, competitors sort of getting along in a, a greater ecosystem for their business. So, so for example, today, if you look at the, the market for uh, coffee houses or coffee shops, whatever you want to call them, the... the um, Starbucks, Pete's Coffee, um, the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf. I'm sure there there are others in 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 your local area. So, when Starbucks first started in the 1970s and started to gain traction in the marketplace, it was assumed that they were just going to wipe out all of their competitors. Because that's what had happened before when a category killer had come in. So, for example, with the advent of Office Depot and uh, Staples, when these large office supply chains developed, where you could go into their stores where they just had thousands upon thousands of products right there available to you, they wiped out all the small office supply uh, stores in their area, in their country. In fact, um, I, I remember when that happened, I was, I was in business at that time, and I had a friend who she and her husband owned a, a very popular 
albeit one store office supply store in the West Los Angeles area. And I, I patronized their business for years and years and years. I used to love to go into their store, very personalized service. They knew everything you could know about office supplies. If they didn't have it in the store, they knew where to get it. Um, oftentimes they would drop stuff by my office if it was if I came in and it wasn't available. Um, and it wasn't like they had a delivery service per se. It's just my friend sometimes she would just come by on her way home and say, hey, this came in, Kevin. I thought I'd drop it by on my way home. A very, very personalized uh, service, you know, ongoing relationships with your customers. When Staples came in and, and Office Depot came in, they struggled and struggled and struggled, and eventually they went out of business. They could not compete. They couldn't, the, what, what Office uh, Depot and Staples could sell their products for was just so much lower than what they could sell their products for. They couldn't stay in business. And, and virtually every small office supply store in Los Angeles was wiped out. And, and that's what the category killers sought to do, just destroy the competition, right? And and now, you know, and, and, and by the way, there was, and there was a third, there was Office Depot, Staples, and there was a third one. And eventually the third one was destroyed. See, I don't even remember its name now, but there were three big ones. And now all you have left is Office Depot and Staples. And, and they constantly are battling it out, I think, for one to destroy the other. That's how it is in office supplies. Now, people thought the same thing was going to happen with Starbucks, that they were going to come in and just wipe out all the small, quaint coffee houses. That is not what happened. Now, I, I, I don't want to say, I don't know that it was by design or not. I, I, from what I've read about how Howard Schultz conceived um, Starbucks, he had no particular desire to destroy other small coffee houses. And indeed, Starbucks did not. What Starbucks did was it raised the bar of, of people's expectations for quality coffee. Um, it, it probably had a bad effect on, um, well, it did have a bad effect on on like um, Jack in the Box and McDonald's, places like that where people would get their coffee, where the coffee was historically pretty, pretty mediocre at best. But for these small coffee houses that were that had always served premium coffee and had things like lattes and cappuccinos and all these, you know, coffee drinks, it, it actually didn't cause them to go out of business. It brought them more business because all of a sudden, Every coffee drinker was looking for that premium coffee experience that Starbucks brought to you know to everyone. I was going to say to the masses. I, I don't really I don't like that term, but but to every everyone, all of a sudden could start appreciating really great coffee, and 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 it forced. So even even a company like McDonald's, which is the largest restaurant company in the world, it forced them to improve their coffee. The same with, uh, I, I think the same is true of Jack in the Box. So McDonald's had their Mc, McCafe, uh, I think it was, I think it's called. Um, and, and so it raised the bar for everybody. And nowadays, the, the coffee business, uh, the, the coffee shop business, is is flourishing, um, and 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 in fact, Starbucks is pro probably has more problems than the typical small coffee house does um, because they are so big, they're so prominent, and 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 you know they at times they overexpanded or they tried certain products that didn't work. So so I would argue that Starbucks is an example of maneuver in business. Now, here's what I mean by maneuver, maneuver warfare or maneuver combat theory as applied to business, okay? Now, well, so let, actually, let me take a step back. When we talk about maneuver applied to combat, we're talking about the idea of 
rapid advancing, overwhelming the enemy in a way that they can't mount an effective defense and still destroying them, right? Because in the end, in combat, we do need to destroy the enemy's ability to fight. So that destruction is there, okay? That sort of ultimate destruction. In business, we're not looking for that ultimate destruction. What we're looking for is a melding of people's interests, okay? And when I say people's interests, what I mean is we want to look at our potential customers and clients and say, how do we serve them in a way that our interests come together? So rather than sort of, you know, beating a potential customer into submission so they finally buy, like in the, you know, like I said, in the old sort of, you know, um, uh, bullpen sales, you know, phone sales things and things like that. That's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to find out what do our customers, what do our clients really need and how do we supply those needs most effectively, right? And so now let's look at that in, in a, a business context. Let's take up of our examples. One of the problems that I think Staples and Office Depot have is they have no customer loyalty. I mean, I know for me, if I can get it cheaper at Staples, I'll go to Staples. I, I prefer to go to Office Depot, but only because it's closer to, you know, closer to where I live. But 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 Staples isn't so far away that, you know, an ex for an extra five to maybe 10 minutes drive, I'll I'll go to Staples. Because in the end, frankly, neither one of their stores are particularly attractive. Their selections aren't that much bigger. Um, I mean, their people are nice, but uh, I, I rarely see the same people there um, unless I happen to go back within a very short period of time. So I have no connection to the people, no long-term connection to the people who work there. So, you know, they're essentially competing on price. That's all they've got, okay? Whereas when it comes to things like restaurants or where I go get a coffee, so I'm not so much coffee because I, I think Starbucks, frankly, has the same problem that, you know, uh, um, uh, Staples and, and Office Depot have. But when I go to a restaurant, I get to know the people who work there. In fact, at my daughter's and my favorite restaurant, we know everyone that works there and we know them pretty well. We know a lot of their background what they've done in past jobs. We know many of their likes and dislikes and they know us, okay? So they have maneuvered, and I don't mean they did anything underhanded or anything. They Their aim is when you come to this restaurant, uh, but it's called the Milky Way. I'll, I'll, I'll give them a plug because I, I my daughter, I love them so much. When you go to the Milky Way, what they aim to do is make you, not make you, but, but have you, enjoy yourself so much, feel so at home that you come back, right? And that was historically what a, a great restaurant did. And this is why the Milky Way has been around for, I think it's 40 years now, uh, because people come there year after year, decade after decade. So they're looking, how do we satisfy our customers in a way that they'll want to come back, okay? And, and that's the same thing in, in any business. Now, to really, and especially if you're in some kind of profession, whether it's real estate, financial services, um, what you're looking to do is build relationships, accounting, uh, the law. Okay, These have always been uh, relationship-driven businesses. In order to build that relationships, those relationships. You cannot just be pounding, pounding, pounding on your clients. It doesn't work. You've got to maneuver. And maneuver requires us to know a lot about the people with whom we're dealing. Now, in warfare, we want to know about them so that we can destroy them. In business, we want to know about them so we can join with them. Okay, and 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 we we also want to be able to maneuver 
so that as we confront the competition, we're not so much looking to destroy the competition, we're looking to stay ahead of the competition. That's also a maneuver function. And it's better because the, the market for premium coffee has just exploded over the last roughly 50 years. Um, and, 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 it and it not just in coffee shops, in terms of uh, coffee available in grocery stores, now you have all kinds of coffee makers. I know when I was a kid, all you had was the percolator. And you, it, was, this is, it would just percolate. The water would churn through the grounds. And I mean, if it sat for any length of time, I'm told because I didn't drink coffee back then, it became very bitter, very strong, oily. It was like the coffee was not great. Now you have you have drip coffee makers, you have, you know, Cuisinart coffee makers, you've got uh, um, uh, with the pods, um, obviously, like Kerrig coffee makers, you have um, Nest, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, not Nest Cafe. Um, they make the the pods too for making um, uh, for making es es espresso and cappuccinos and such. Um, shoot, I, I can't think of what it's called. I have a machine in my kitchen, right? I've got, I've got, I have actually uh, three coffee machines in my kitchen. I have a Keurig. I've got a Cuisinart for um uh, for for you know making a whole big pot of coffee, a Keurig to make an individual one, and then I have my one for making cappuccinos and uh, I mean I don't drink cappuccinos but espressos, um, Nespresso that's it Nespresso right. So we have all of these coffee makers now. By the way, this was pretty common in um, Europe long before it was common here in the United States. OK, and, and but the coffee business in the United States has just exploded in the last 50 years. That's due to maneuver, a maneuver style of business where where companies, just even even small companies. And when I say a small company, a, a one store a coffee shop or um, I mean, Nespresso was a was not a big company originally. It's since been bought and become part of a larger company. But um where they realized that to you know set out to destroy this one or this one, th there, there's no point in doing that. What we need to focus on is making our products better, finding more products that customers really like, and 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 promoting those, and 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 creating a relationship with our customers. So, um, I you know I I think uh, by the way I I somewhat misspoke when I said that Starbucks is like. Um, uh, Office Depot and Staples, because in a way, Starbucks seeks to create a relationship with their customer through this idea that 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 their their cafes were were the uh, the, the sort of third living room, I think they call it, or a second living room. It was a place where people should come, stay, enjoy a cup of coffee, read a newspaper. So they did. They tried to create. They worked to create a relationship with their customers, even if it wasn't necessarily a relationship between the barista and the customer, it was a relationship between a particular location and the customer. So it's a, you know, a different way maybe of thinking about relationships, but it was a relationship nonetheless. Let me just see how we're doing on time here. Oh, wow, it just, it zoomed by. So as we think about the theory of war as applied to business, what kind of style are we going to, which, which type, which style are we going to pursue? Are we going to pursue a linear style where we essentially attempt to bludgeon our clients and customers into buying from us, into buying our services, buying our products? Or are we going to take a more fleet-footed maneuver type of attitude toward our customers and clients, whereby we're looking to join with them to create a bond of some kind to create an ongoing relationship while we seek to outmaneuver, stay ahead of competitors who are trying to break the bond we have with our customers and capture them themselves. Okay, so that's what I have today. Uh, please join me every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. 2 p.m. Eastern time, an hour in for Central and Mountain time. We Every week we talk about 
business uh, lessons from the military in order to help you improve your business. I want to mention my other two shows. Tomorrow is People Making Money, where we talk about job hunting, career development, finances, investing, wealth building. A broader look at how to pursue success in the finance realm of the pursuits pillar of the three pillars of attainment. Sometimes I have guests who have a remarkable way of making a living, and you can always join me live and ask me questions. If I have a guest, ask our uh, guests questions. Just go to Eventbrite, and you can get a free ticket to any of the shows um, that, that are within the Way to Wow Shows family. And then on Mondays now, just yesterday, I launched a third show, and it's called Trusts and Estates Weekly. Now, this is a, a more specific show for people who are involved in matters related to trusts and estates. So if you are a real estate professional, a finance professional, a lawyer, an accountant, and, and you work in the estate and trusts area, so please join me every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we, we're going to talk about all things related, whether they be uh, tax laws, whether they be management issues, investment issues, insurance issues. Okay, We'll talk about documentation, all of these issues related to working with estates and trusts. So I'm, I'm a professional fiduciary here in California. That's part of my business. And I work with these kinds of professionals. And also from time to time, I'll have guests on the show where you can talk to experts in their particular fields, whether it's law, accounting, financial services, et cetera. So we have three shows in the Way to Wow Shows family now. On Mondays, we have um, Trust and Estate Weekly. On Tuesdays, Business Lessons from the Military. And Wednesdays, People Making Money. Please do join me. And as always, if you for if you want to see past shows, over 150 of them now, go to my YouTube channel at The Way to Wow Shows. So thank you very much for joining me today. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow and next week. And that just, just leaves me to sign off and say, Marie, darling, you are my Belle. Have a wonderful rest of the day.